Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe uh, and sign up for Patreon, and you can be the one who asks the questions of my guests next. Maybe you have uh, better questions than me. I'm really excited today to have David Sterry of the band Real Life on. For some of you, maybe you don't know the name David Sterry. Maybe you don't remember the band Real Life by name, but I'm sure you remember their music. The song Send Me an Angel in particular, uh, uh, I think you would know. Uh, it's appeared in so many movies and, and been so popular in so many different countries. I recently was on the, the 80s cruise with Stephen Piercy, who, funny enough, has a cover version of Send Me an Angel. Before you go on these cruises, I like to look and see who's there. And I didn't know every band. And I said, let me take a look and see what real life is like these days. And I watched uh, some performances of David. And I was really blown away and I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know, he still has it. Sometimes you see people, you go, oh boy, it's not what I remembered. And that uh, gave me a, a deep dive into his other music and uh, really uh, enjoyed and became a fan. And when I went on that cruise, one of the things we were looking forward to most was seeing David Sterry we were in real life. We were fortunate enough to see it twice. And we're fortunate enough that all the way from Melbourne, Australia, he is joining us and he'll be here right after this. All right, please welcome David Sterry. Hey, Jason, thank you for the kind words. Oh, thank you so much. And David, what before we got started, uh, you were saying, hey, I looked at your channel and you got a lot of heavy metal bands and you haven't had as much new wave. And I said, it's not for lack of trying. I, I certainly um, would like to mix it up. And one of my favorite things about being able to do this show is to introduce people to different music. Um, and so maybe some people watching know Send Me an Angel or some of the others, but it's so, it's so nice that after this interview, people will go and check out uh, more of your music. We're fortunate you're here. I asked you on the cruise if we would see you in America anytime soon. Uh, you didn't think so. You know, it's it's hard to do this. It is. The, the bookings these days, they're made about 12 months in advance. And um, you've got to organize the visa. The American visa is notoriously hard to get. It, it costs a lot of money and takes months and months. And you're never sure up until virtually the day before you go whether you've got it or not. So at the moment, it's in the too hard bag, but never say never. Yeah, which is a good thing. I, I can't tell you how many people who've been on this show uh, who are in bands uh, in Finland or, or, or Sweden, overseas in general, and they all say the same thing. This visa is very difficult to uh, uh, come by, but we still have the music, and, and thank goodness for cruises like that 80s cruise. Mm. When I met you right before you performed, you said, I feel a little bit like I have imposter syndrome. Um, and uh, explain what you meant. Well, I do. There's a lot of people that you just um, that you don't feel like you're this amazingly talented or gifted person, and you know you really. I was really on the ship, wondering, is anyone going to be at my show? Is anyone going to come and hear me talk? And um, I think of that all the time. I don't walk around. I'm not, I've never been a good rock star, you know. Like you mentioned, my name. People wouldn't know my name. They'd know the song. I was never like this amazing front man like, um, like Stephen Piercy or uh, Michael Hutchins or, you know, anyone from a famous band who had a real rock star at the front. I was never that kind of person, fortunately and unfortunately. And a lot of the people who came out of your genre and will go back aren't necessarily the most recognizable faces. Some people um, of that new wave movement were happy being behind uh, the scenes. Yeah. You know, you couldn't always recognize um everybody so we're going to talk a little bit about your career and then we'll talk a little bit i, I want to get into your movie soundtrack uh you have quite the list of strange movie soundtracks but first david i tell me so you're growing up in australia what uh and i i, I sorry for my horrible new york version of pronunciating any words uh uh, uh australia melbourne I'm, I'm the worst um but uh, i tell me about what first drew you to music 
uh, growing up as a, as a very little kid, I remember when I was about eight years old hearing the Beatles on the radio, hearing She Loves You, Yeah, 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 and going, I understand why I like that. It's because you can't get it out of your head. You repeat it and you repeat it, and that's what becomes a hit song. And then when I was about 13 or 14, I uh, managed to get my parents to get me a guitar and some lessons, and I was just addicted. You know, I was, I was very bad academically at school. I never was going to amount to anything. Uh, and so music was the, was the way to go for me. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I probably interviewed 300 people on this show, but the Beatles is a, a good starting point for most. I, I always hear the Beatles. I hear the Ed Sullivan appearance a lot. And I hear a lot of people say, I look at these screaming girls. I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing that. It's a big part of it, especially if you're a bit of a, a nerd like me. You know, it's the, the girl thing is um, definitely a part of wanting to become a musician. But uh, I remember seeing that Ed Sullivan show. God, I must have been really, really young. But I remember seeing it and just I loved the Beatles. And then it sort of moved, it morphed into um, the Beatles getting a little bit heavier and then seeing or hearing Cream and uh, Jimi Hendrix and then Led Zeppelin. I'm actually... I, quite a heavy rock fan. I saw Led Zeppelin and I saw uh, Black Sabbath and I saw very early Pink Floyd. Uh, but it sort of seemed to, for me, it wasn't until kind of punk had sort of finished because I was never that angry and new wave came along where you didn't have to be an incredible virtuoso uh, to write uh, pop songs of that era. And so that's where I kind of finally came in the door as a musician. Yeah. After uh, the punk movement, post-punk, new wave really um, started to take off and and the music lasted uh, you know people still love that music um, there's a scene for it. people want to dance to it um, clubs are still spinning these uh, these this music these songs uh, uh, real life goes back to 1980 I believe and, and you answered in that or earlier no 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 that's right correct we formed in 1980 yeah it was about about three oh then it was three years before we we wrote send me an angel yeah, and you uh, and you answered an ad, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it was a very early one Saturday morning. I was asleep and there was this loud banging on my door and uh, a friend of mine had brought the, 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 the morning's paper and said, David, there's an ad in here from a keyboard player and you have to call that number. And I went, oh, no, 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 no. no. But I eventually did and, and it, it changed my life. It's one of one of those moments where you can go, wow, if I had not have done that, I don't know what would have happened. And your partner in the band, his name is Richard Satorsky, is that right? Correct, Richard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and you guys, I said again? It was the key, a keyboard player, the keyboard player in the ad. And uh, the thing was about, the ad was pretty much about looking for a guitar player to write songs. And that was the thing about New Wave. You had these brand new synthesizers that had these amazing sounds mixed with guitar, you know, some rock guitar as well. So that's what attracted me to the, the ad. Yeah. And it happens fast. You know, not everybody, uh, it happens that way. But in your case, it happens um, pretty fast. Tell me, uh, the song Send Me an Angel, you, you heard a demo that Richard put together, right? Yeah. yeah. And so tell me when, uh, what, what you thought when you heard it and how you added to it. Well, I was actually, we were going to a gig down on a, an island that's um, about three hours' drive from Melbourne where we lived, and um, you had, had an early Walkman thing, and Richard and I had been trying to write something that would be a single. We, we, we'd become a very successful unrecorded band. Uh, we'd fill venues. People would come and see us on a Monday or a Tuesday night, but we didn't have anything that was an outstanding single, and we were going to this uh, gig down the coast, and uh, Richard handed me a cassette and said, have a listen to this. And I heard da, 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 the keyboard open line. I went, ah, oh, you know, I don't know what's coming next, but he's got it. He's got it. This is it. And uh, we, I didn't do much more. I think I may have come up with the title of sitting in the car listening to it. We went and did the gig, uh, came home the next day, and I sat down and the song was finished about 20 minutes after I started really working on it the next day. So this is one of those songs. It's funny how that happens. Peter Frampton talks about how he wrote, uh, do you feel like I feel and ooh baby, I love the way, both before noon on the same day, he said, I've been waiting my whole life to have another oh. day like that. You know? Wow, 
And what a what a beautiful guy Peter Frampton is. What great music, great voice. And and any time I see an interview with with Peter Frampton, I'll sit and watch it. You know, amazing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, From small faces up to Humble Pie, and then the solo career. You know, I love Humble Pie, Stevie Marriott as well. Yeah. No, in, in, incredible stuff. And so uh, it happens that fast. Uh, tell me a little bit about how the song first comes out in Australia, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, it sort of, it did okay. Um, it, it was in the top, uh, we got to the top 10 in Melbourne where I live, and I think it was top 20 for the rest of the, the country. And we thought, well, that's about that, you know, and then uh, that was about the middle of the year, 1983, it came out here, and then it came out later there was a guy called uh, Rick Carroll who used to be the, the station programmer for K-Rock uh, back in the 80s when, you know, K-Rock was a fantastic station, brought all the, the sort of the new wave music and uh, to to, uh, to America, brought all the, the British bands, The Clash and Depeche Mode and New Order and all those bands came via K-Rock. So Rick Carroll was in Australia programming a station in Sydney uh, to make it sound like K-Rock. And he heard Send Me an Angel on the radio at the time and he loved it. And he went racing back to America with it and put it straight on K-Rock. And we didn't even have a record deal. It wasn't even out. So we were in, you know, ah, what are we going to do? We're getting played. And uh, we haven't got a record deal. So, yeah, that was the story. A lot, of artists, a lot of artists got discovered through K-Rock. Uh, yeah. Some of Rodney on the Rocks, some of the other people um, out of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, you know, great, great DJs. They all had their own character and their own sort of style. And they really, you know, brought, you know, even bands like Duran Duran and Spandau Ballet, all the bigger new wave bands, but they brought a whole lot of little new wave bands and alternative bands over as well. I mean, The Cure, uh, Susie and the Banshees, you know, if it wasn't for K-Rock, I'm not sure that that, that that would have had such an impact in the 80s. Yeah, and, and broke through here in, in America. Um, yeah. Tell me about some of the bands that you were playing with at the time, because some of these bands have become household names. Yeah, well, we were, you know, we we'd start out and we'd have a, what we call rent a crowd. We could get about thirty people into a pub to see us on a night, and then after a few gigs, they'd sort of be fading away and, and losing a little bit of interest. And so we we started getting bigger gigs, supporting bands that were already established, and trying to to. Um, steal a few of their crowd to come to our next solo show. So we were opening for the church, Ice House, Midnight Oil. Um, in excess, uh, right? Yeah, you know, in excess, of course, yes, yes, many times. Uh, so, and we always, we always, you know, I managed to um, uh, get a few people back to our gigs. I remember the Midnight Oil gig, that Midnight Oil fans hated support bands. And uh, we, uh, there's barricades, the Midnight Oil audience back in those days was drunk men, you know, just a couple of thousand drunk men going, you know, get off, piss off, you know, and, and uh, telling you, you know, that, that they hated you. And uh, we went off, we did our we did our set, thought, oh, thank God, that's over. Went back into the dressing room and Midnight Oil's manager was there and he said, guess what, guys, that was really good. Go and do another 40 minutes. And uh, we went, oh, no. So we had to go back out to face that barrage of abuse again. And at the end of it, I'm kind of saying, look, you know, by the way, we have a show at a pub called Macy's on Tuesday night. Why don't you come along? It's like, boo, boo, get off, get off, get off. But that next Tuesday night um, at, at our solo show, there's at least 10 of the guys that were screaming abuse and they're going to kill us, get off. And I said, <laughs> we thought you guys hated us. And they said, uh, you've got to do that at a midnight oil gig to the support band. We really liked you. And we heard that there were girls that would come and see you guys as well. They don't go to midnight oil gigs, so we'll come and see you. So we did that, you know, to, with a lot of bands. I'm going to see in excess, there was just girls. There was nothing but girls. But um, uh, with midnight oil, we had to work pretty hard. Yeah. I, and what's interesting is that here in America, midnight oil wouldn't break until much later. It wasn't mm. until beds were yeah. burning. Which is probably late '80s, early yes. '90s that yeah. that they broke. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. It was kind of surprising actually because they very much are a very, you know, uh, political Australian band, and, and I thought a lot of the concepts that w they were singing about Americans wouldn't understand or perhaps resent 
Um, what's the song? U.S. forces give the nod and songs like that. I thought, oh, that's not going to go down well in America. But then, of course, Peter Garrett became a politician uh, here in Australia. Right. He was in government. Right. Yeah. 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 It's 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 funny. As I was trying to think of who I've had on the show who was Australian, but uh, Rose Tattoo. I forgot about Rose oh, Tattoo. Okay. Well, angry. <laughs> angry. Yeah, Angry's been on. Uh, yeah. I don't think he answered one question. I, really? I, he, he talked about politics and other things, but <clears throat> everything just kind of, he asked more questions about me and we just kind of went in this circle, but. It's kind of a conversation, yeah. Yeah, it, it was interesting. At what year do you first come to America? Uh, 1980, uh, 1984, yeah. Oh, by the way, too, we opened for um, Rose Tattoo once, which was pretty frightening. <laughs> we were just at a really rough hotel, and um, it was full of bikers, you know, kind of standing like this, you know, not not acknowledging us virtually at all. It's like pretty terrifying. But I remember walking up after the gig, and the guitar player at the time, I think his name was Rob Riley, lovely man, really, really big guy, great guitar, bluesy guitar player. And he kind of poked me in the chest, and he said, I really like you guys, but you certainly need a few more roast dinners, you know, because I was incredibly skinny at the time. <laughs> but, yeah, so, yeah, we finally got to America in 1983. We, we were opening for Eurythmics, so we did a big tour all the way around America. Then we went through Canada all by ourselves, and then we came down the east coast again of America with uh, Berlin. We were yeah. being friends since those days. Yeah, you got Berlin, great band. It's it's a funny thing. Berlin definitely had a new wave sound, even a punk at times, but they yeah. would get known for the song from Top Gun, uh, You Take My Breath Away, which yeah. didn't really represent um, that band. But uh, what a great bill. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it was a lot. This was, this was before, of course, before Take My Breath Away. And there were a lot of similarities. You know, it was the, uh, lots of keyboards and lots of guitars at the same time as well. So, and of course, you know, uh, Terry's a, a great uh, front person, and uh, we're still friends with all all those guys from that band. So, mm. yeah. Did you know she auditioned uh, to play Princess Leia in Star Wars? Yes, yes, yes. There's a video of that on YouTube somewhere. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, audition. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she she had done some television acting before that. I think hadn't she? She'd been in some TV show. I think. Maybe. Yeah, I think she had done she had done some stuff, but um. Songs that people might know, like Metro, definitely fit that, you know, that synth new wave vibe. And yeah. I can only imagine that being a great show. What year do you go on American Bandstand with Dick Clark? Uh, ooh, I think it was probably 1984 as well. Yeah, it was yeah. American Bandstand and, and Solid Gold, which was, <laughs> yeah. Right. Which, is, which is really, you know, because, you know, very few Australian bands had had any success in America, you know, that we were... Uh, there was Little River Band, there was Olivia Newton-John, finally Men at Work. Uh, and then, you know, it, we were over there even before In Excess. And so it was really, because we had those TV shows here in Australia as well, and never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that we'd be on, you know, Bandstand or Solid Gold. Also, when I was really young, uh, I had a transistor radio that you would hold up to your ear, ran on batteries and, and every Sunday night on the local radio show, they had a show called um, American Top 40 with a guy called Casey Kasem. So I was listening to this when I was about, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. And then amazingly, you know, 20 years later, here's Casey Kasem announcing there's a band from Australia called Real Life and, you know, and we're in American Top 40. So, you know, those things are just amazing when that, when that happens to you. That is one of the memories that people tell me a lot to say that they heard Casey Kasem introduce their song because he was yeah. such a massive deal. And as you said, worldwide, you could hear him yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're talking about 84, you know, sort of being this breakthrough uh, year. And I, I should point out that in 1984, uh, hold on, let's find it. Uh, uh, this movie was released. And this is... <laughs> This is Voyage of the Rock Aliens. Ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> In yes. case you forgot. No, and, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned that um, on stage. Because the night, be the night before my first gig on the boat, I'd seen Wang Chung. And you know, Wang Chung are great. And they were telling stories about, you know, some of their songs in soundtracks. And they've got 
songs in some really good movies. And I was just pointing out um, that we had songs in movies, but most of them were just rubbish. And I did mention this one. There's a song called Open Heart in it. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and so I spent the whole night going, okay, this one was in uh, a vampire movie and this one was in a BMX movie and this one, you know. I was so, taking I was taking notes, oh, trust me. Oh, oui, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Pia Zadora movie. Yeah. Uh, I think you have two songs. I think a song called Always is also on the soundtrack. I didn't know that. But, yeah, no one, if you were there and I said, has anyone ever heard of Voyage to the Rock Islands? And there wasn't really anyone in the audience that reacted to that one. So I'm glad you did. I'm glad you proved me right. Yes, we have to. Uh, uh, and you did point out, though, you've, you've never seen this movie. No, I haven't. No, no. Yeah, I don't but think you've been Whatever happened to Piers Dora? She was like a singer as well, wasn't she? She lives here in Las Vegas, which is where oh, I am right now. And she has a club cafe night where she goes and she sings and she still looks beautiful. Oh, good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, so she, she's, still, uh, she's still active. We'll, we'll stick to the movie trend for just a second. Uh, Open Hearted was the second single off... Um, off uh, the record, right? Uh, yes, yes, and it immediately did nothing. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. I refuse not to play it. You know. I love, yeah. Oh, I love and it. I think the, the audience loves it. it, it yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nineteen eighty-five. Once mm -hmm. bitten, uh, mm -hmm. which is Jim Carrey's sort of big debut movie, and you guys have a song called "Face to Face" in that one. Yeah, that was off our second album. So yeah, and it's another movie I haven't seen. Um, so, yeah, I, and you kind of wonder. I think I think Open Heart is on the credits of Voyage of the Rock Islands, so you never know whether you're going to be whether you're just on the credits of the outro or in some scene in the middle somewhere as well. There was also um, Savage Streets with the Linda Blair. Yeah, with Linda Blair. I think I'm not sure what was in which song was in there, but that was there as well. Yeah. Yeah, how, how funny. I have that record on vinyl signed by Linda Blair somewhere in my collection. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Wow. Of, all, of all strange. I've got a lot of strange memorabilia in, in my collection. I saw oh. Once Bitten when I was younger and thought it was vaguely funny, a horror comedy. Um, but I, I don't remember. Uh, if, I don't know how, what I would think of it today. Um, I will say that just a couple of weeks ago, I went to an anniversary screening uh, of a movie that was playing here in the United States in theaters again, and that movie is Rad, the BMX ah, yes. uh, uh, opus. Yeah. Now, yeah. I haven't seen that either. Uh, so that's the most amazing one to me, that you haven't seen it, because I kept saying, my big question is, has he seen Rad? So when I was a kid uh, growing up in New York City, I got a VHS tape of it, and I enjoyed it, but I did remember enjoying the music. A guy named John Farnham sang uh, a lot of the songs on the soundtrack, and they were very catchy. It was, yeah. it was sort of a Rocky movie or Karate Kid, just with uh, bicycles. And I don't—I never even knew how to ride a bike. That wasn't a thing that we did in in New York City, at least. Um, but I liked the movie, so I said I have to go to this screening and try to refresh my memory and see what I'll think. And then after seeing you, I said, I've got to see uh, uh, Send Me an Angel uh, on the big screen. Now, did you at least see the scene that your song is in? Yeah, yeah I've seen the scene. It's on. It's all over YouTube. But did you also see um, um, Brad Pitt doing I did. a cameo? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was a couple of years ago. That was like really, I, I couldn't work out the connection of why he was doing that. Um, but I was very happy to see it. I'm going, what? What? It's crazy. But no, Jimmy I haven't Fallon, seen it. Jimmy Fallon had Brad Pitt on the show promoting a movie, and he was making the point that uh, you can hide people with stuntmen. In the movie Rad, whenever one of the kids gets on the bike, they put on a helmet because the stuntman does the rest. Okay, okay, okay. And so, he, so Brad Pitt uh, does it. Now, for anyone watching who hasn't seen Rad or know this scene, it, it, it's a dance, a school dance. And the kids, uh, Lori Laughlin, who was Laughlin, who was on uh, Full House here in America, she's the girl and uh, and the actor, and they do this sort of romantic dance on their bikes while Send Me an Angel plays, and it is so ridiculous. 
But the audience was loving it. In my theater, people were cheering when, when yeah. that scene happened and that song came on. You know, there's also, there was a, a guy in America wrote to me quite a few, few years back who was a kid when that came out and he loved it. I think he was, uh, him and his friends live in Redondo Beach or somewhere down, down that way. And every year they get out on their bikes, on their, on their BMX bikes, and they have a ghetto blaster and they go for this big long ride uh, and recreate that kind of scene. So they do it, they love the thing so much. They've got the ghetto blast, they've got semi age, and they go for this annual ride. And I thought it, 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 it's, it's incredible. And the song has become so known to different generations. And on that boat, younger people are discovering it. it it's really, it, it's, it's the song that just keeps going and, and giving. I, I got to ask you: Is that can you make some money off of these things when the Tonight Show uses the song? And do you still yeah. see Send Me an Angel uh, bread? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. It, it, it pays my rent. You know, it, it still pays my rent. So, so you know, people jokingly every now and then ask me, you know, hey, did you ever find that? Did you ever find the angel? And I went, well, the song is the angel because it's it gave me a life that I would never have imagined. <laughs> I, I love it. But well said. I also love how you introduced the song line alive. If you wouldn't mind uh, indulging me and in saying that about changing one word. Oh. <laughs> oh, did I say sausage or did I say something worse? You said sausage. Oh, did I? Okay, yeah, yeah. Change one word and you know, change the word from sausage to angel, and uh, there you go. Yeah. You said it's amazing what you could do when you just change one word in a song, <laughs> and it stayed with me because it was just. Um, uh, so funny, but it made so many people happy, as I've said. That song really was such a part of my childhood and other people's and and uh, and just really one of those great new wave songs that made you wonder why we didn't get more real life. Although Send Me an Angel wasn't done in 1986. It wasn't done in 84. It wasn't done in 86. It came out again in 89 and yes. kind of tore up the charts here. Yes, it did. Yeah, I think it even... Um, charted higher the second time than it did the first time, you know. And that yeah, was, um, I so. I'd heard um, uh, one of my all-time favourite songs is Blue Monday by New Order. I just love great. that. One of the greatest songs ever. Yep. And uh, in around about 1987 or 88, Quincy Jones, of all people, did a remix of that. I thought, oh, that's a, an, odd, an odd, you know, odd couple, but it worked. And uh, I... Wondered out loud in front of our record company, wonder what, what a new version of Send Me an Angel would sound right, like, and they just went, ah, yes, let's try that. So they sent it to an English guy and it and came back and they were really, really happy with it. And, you know, it, it happened all over again. It, so, it, yeah, it, it worked. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that remix sort of maybe made it a little more modern at that time. Um, yeah. But very similar, obviously, and and... It, the the hook of that song um, was there, but yeah, and I so I think that different generations kept be uh, being exposed to it. Now, if you didn't see Rad, there's no way you saw Teen Wolf two in 1987. Ah, no, but I did. Did I tell you? you did, I, did I talk about this? You, you know, when you you were mentioning what I said on the night, I always say to the band as we're going on, I say, look, you know, I don't know whether I'll be able to say anything tonight or whether I'll be just looking at my shoes. I'm not sure what's going to come out of my mouth, but please just bear with me. This is for uh, uh, Chris and, and Dave, my my band. And so I never remember what I've said. I, I you know, I go, blah, 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 blah. I tend to sort of babble on a little bit. Um, but sorry, what was that question again? It was, it was. I was asking if you saw a Teen Wolf too. That's right. That's right. Yes. Okay. So I was actually living uh, in Hollywood at the time that came out. Uh, this was 1987, I think. Yes. Um, and I was over there because there was no fax machines, hadn't been invented yet, let alone, you know, the internet or anything else. And I needed to be over near my record company because they weren't really answering calls. You know, it was like, you know, I need to be there so I can, you know, motivate them to, to be motivated by us, etc. cetera. And um, my manager ran out one day and said, David, guess what? You know, um, you're going to a movie premiere tonight. It's down on Hollywood Boulevard. I think it was the Egyptian Theatre. And uh, and it's a movie, Teen Wolf 2, and uh, there's you you want to guess they're on the door list. So I rang up a friend over there, Google Linda, 
and they said, guess what? You know, I've got tickets for a Hollywood movie uh, launch and we're, and, and we're going, and I wouldn't tell her why we were going, you know. And so we wandered in down the red carpet. Thank God no one knew who I was. And uh, halfway through the movie, which was not a great movie, there's this really slow motion fight scene or something. And da, 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 da. And I was like, oh, no. You know? And I just sank down in my seat and the girl looked over at me with just like disgust on her face. And, yes, so I did see that one. Yeah. Yeah, of, of, all, of all the ones, that might be the worst. Did you like that one? I barely remember it. I saw that yeah. one on cable. Uh, uh, Michael J. Fox was in the original. Uh, Jason Bateman plays his cousin yeah. in uh, the second. I've heard you tell some funny stories about reacting to your music. One was uh, being in your car the first time you heard send me an angel and the person next to you happened to be listening to the same radio station and heard it as well and in your excitement what did you do well i had this really beaten up old car and uh i was pulled up the slides and this beautiful uh woman in a, a convertible red convertible pulled up beside me and and you know all of a sudden you know angel comes on the radio and i'm kind of yeah wow well, wow well, you know i had the window down I looked over and she had the same radio station on. She was, you know, obviously enjoying the song. And I'm trying to go, you know, hey, hey, lady, you know, hey, me, me, me. And she looked around and sneered at me. And the lights changed and you went, <laughs> and it was again. What about, what about the young lady in the supermarket when the song comes on, uh, the cashier? Oh, uh, yeah, all of a sudden they knew who you were. You know, all those, these, I love cashiers. You know, there's something like that. Cashiers in supermarkets, or you don't have them anymore. You've got to pay automatically. But um, yeah, auto. There was, there was this one television show in Australia called Countdown, and it would come on on a Sunday night, and everyone watched it. Families, you know, old, young, everyone watched Countdown, and that was the first time <clears throat> Semi and Angel was on the show. And so the next day, you know, everywhere I went, you know, people who thought I was just a strange kind of guy with a silly haircut and a silly walk or whatever. You know, going to the supermarket, just everyone treats you so differently. And so there's all those beautiful girls. And I never ever got to date um, a checkout chick, but um, all of a sudden they knew that I was um, a rock star or something. Mm -hmm. There's one story, though, that you told where uh, the song came on and there was a young lady oh, working. Oh, that, yes, yes, yes. That was that was sort of fairly recent, actually, or just a few years ago. And uh, so he reminds this old man wandering around the supermarket. And I love uh, supermarkets seem to sort of dwell on the 80s a lot. And yes, every, yeah. time, every time I, I'm in the supermarket, I'm listening to something, I know or I've worked with just about everyone that I hear on the, on the playback. And um, I was, it was a strange, surreal moment in the supermarket. And I went and stood under the speaker because I wanted to hear my guitar solo from under the, the speaker. And I noticed that the staff are kind of, they're packing some shelves and they're grooving around with it. You know, they're, they're all enjoying it. And I get to the the the, the front of the checkout chick, and um, she's kind of bopping around. She's quite young, singing along. And uh, I said, "Hey, you know, you like that song?" She said, "Yeah." And I said, "Hey, that's me." And all of a sudden, she looked at me like I was a pedophile. And I thought, oh, "I'm never going to do that again." But everyone in the supermarket knows that now, and they all just laugh at me now. So they all remember what happened, and they remind me. So there's no no escaping. Yeah, it wasn't this guy that we're looking at right here. Uh, you were you were a little bit older with it. Yeah, movie. yeah, I'm more like I look like now. Yeah, who is that guy? Wow, who are those young men? What happened? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, where are these guys now? Uh, okay, so from left to right, that's Richard, who um, I haven't seen in about thirty years or something. Um, we is he retired? Yeah, he was the uh, yes, he is. He was the keyboard player. Yeah. Um, who wrote that, you know, the piece of music. And uh, we we didn't get along all that well, you know, but, but God bless him, you know, accepting me as a songwriting partner. And, you know, I hope he did he did leave the band and uh, have a go at a, forming another band where he was more the focal point and more the front person sort of thing, and nothing came of it. Uh, the next guy in the picture is Alan, Alan Johnson, our bass player. Um, Alan... Just 
gave up out of frustration quite a few years ago. There was never a lot of money to be made in real life. We went on tour. It cost us a lot of money. We made a record. We, we weren't recouping enough for it. So Alan just sort of out of frustration kind of left in about um, 2000, I think it was. And on the other side of me, uh, on the right, is Danny, Danny Simpson, who was our original drummer. And uh, Dan's still about. He's, he's a mate. He's a friend. Uh, and he's survived uh, stage three colon cancer. So, you know, there's a lot of people that you know in the music business, you know, uh, getting on a bit and we're all sort of battling things like cancer or stuff like that. So, but Danny's um, alive and well. Yeah, well, it's good to hear that he's, he's doing uh, well. It, this business isn't for everybody and staying at it and having longevity. We're talking about a 40 plus year career for you, yeah. uh, uh, even more. Um, and so not everyone can do it. You were fortunate to write a song. You know, they, they joke about the gray whistle test. Can the gray hair ladies whistle your song? Or uh, uh, can, you, can you remember that chorus? Well, you have one that generations have found. You've stayed with it. And you've said that it's because music is what you do. Um, whether, you know, and for you, whether millions of people discovered or multiple people discovered, whatever it is, music is, is your passion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's anything else I can do, and I'm certainly not God's gift to the music business, that's for sure, you know. Um, but um, it's – I remember on the ship singing the Semi and Angel, you know, as soon as people hear the, the, the chords, you just see nothing from where I am, you see nothing but people who are just going to forget everything bad in their life for three and a half minutes. So what a privilege is, is it to have that happen to you, you know. It's, it's just wonderful. I get some – Beautiful letters about um, people tell you a little bit about their lives um, when they talk about the song. I recently got a beautiful uh, letter and photo from somebody who um, whose son is autistic. He's about two or three years old and hardly non nonverbal, but he just comes to life when Send Me an Angel comes on. So what what greater reward could anyone possibly have? Yeah, absolutely. And so a lot of people like myself may go, well, I'm going to go here, Send Me an Angel. but uh, 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 we we loved it. The rest we, we got hooked on everything else, and then the next thing you know, look, Spotify might not pay artists very well, but boy, you can get instant music. And all of a sudden, uh, God, we're listening to God tonight, and uh, and and all these songs that we're thinking, how did we miss these? But for us, it's it's fresh. We're getting to experience something that mm -hmm. just sounds it sounds so great, and and it's heavy live too. You know, it 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 has a new life. Some of these songs. Yeah, well, we're sort of um, uh, um, uh, what you said, heavy. I think people are always surprised when they see us that we're a bit heavier and more performance orientated than they would expect from us. So, you know, we always used to, when, you know, when you're opening for bands like Rose Tattoo and Midnight Oil, you've got to sort of be able to put something out, you know. So it's about trying to put out and seeing what you get back and trying to build on that. I think every performer that, you know, does the same thing with that situation. Yeah, and I, I, I've been dwelling on 1983's Heartland. That's the, that's the mm -hmm. record that most people know. That's the first time uh, um, that Send Me an Angel uh, was released. There is that record right now. And I'm sure yeah. a lot of people have it or heard it. If you haven't, you can do that now. Um, that wasn't the end of real life, 1985. Claim 1990 Lifetime. Um, you're the only constant uh, member, as you've said. Uh, you've kept real life, the brand going. Yeah, yeah. I guess um, you know, there's there's a lot of bands that that are out there who maybe shouldn't be using a name, like Little River Band, for instance. Um, there's no one, there's none of those singers or songwriters in that band anymore, but they still go out and uh, tour. But um, for me, it was I wrote the songs, um, I sang the songs. So I um, – and, and no one ever asked me about anyone else from the band. No one ever says anything about Richard. Or, there's been a few keyboard players in the band and a couple of drummers, and no one ever comes up and says, you know, why isn't so-and-so here? So um, um, I guess I'm getting away with it. Well, I don't think it was that type of band where, you know, uh, if it was Duran Duran or something, uh, yeah. each guy had a pin-up and they knew who everyone was, yeah. whereas – other than they knew the, the 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 front person again, you played the guitar, you sang the songs, you wrote the songs, and so it wasn't a band where everyone knew every name. And 
that's when I looked it up because when we go on those 80s cruises, I go, let me see what, what bands are real and which bands are just ridiculous. And yeah. uh, most of the lineups on that boat were pretty, was pretty good. But when I yeah. saw real, real life, I said, well, let me watch a modern clip. And uh, I saw you and that's all I needed. I was like, well, this is the yeah. guy. This, these are the songs and I, I want to see more. And I think that that's what uh, the audience feels. So I don't feel like you're the, uh, uh, an imposter in any way. No, no. I, I mean, there's no actual band. Whoever's behind me that's been for the last um, 10, 15 years, whoever's behind me is real life these days. And going on, on that cruise, uh, I couldn't, I didn't have the budget to fly the people that I would use here uh, over there. It would have been sort of, you know, I'd be practically not making any, any money out of it. Uh, so, I, you know, I had uh, uh, Chris Olivas and uh, Dave Schultz, and they were both from Berlin. They both played in Berlin for a long time. So, I, at least, you know, I knew them. We were still very, very nervous about going and doing it. I remember I arrived in uh, L.A. on a, a Sunday night. Uh, we had a 10 o'clock rehearsal the next morning. You know, this is like after a 16-hour flight for me. Um, a rehearsal 10 o'clock the next morning. And as soon as they started playing, I knew that they'd done, they put in the, the, the homework, they'd done their homework and everything was going to be all right. And they were worried about, you know, what I was going to be like too. I mean, even though they knew me, we didn't know what was going to happen until we started playing something. And I was it instantly put at ease with those two guys. They'd really done their work and they were so confident in what they were doing. It's like they'd been playing it for ages. So we, we had a six hour rehearsal. So that's all we had before doing that show. We did a, a sound check where we played a couple of songs, but that was it. So, you know, blessed to those guys. It was, it was good. And, um, yeah, having two guys from Berlin, well, it's, you know, they're not that far removed from real life anyway. So it was great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you couldn't, you couldn't tell because there are a lot of parts in those songs. There's a lot of vocals in those songs and, um, and, and you couldn't tell. Now, obviously, that is how things are affordable these days. Sort of the pickup band. Chuck Berry was the king of the pickup band. Yeah, you know, yeah. Go up and learn my songs. And it, it, we're fortunate that we get to, to see you because otherwise, um, who knows if we would have seen you in America, even though this hat, we were in Aruba and Curacao. Yeah. But uh, it, was great to, it was great to see you. I was fortunate the guys in my organization all got off. And then another band got on. The English Beat was the one. Uh, but I was fortunate uh, that we stayed until the very end because we got to. I kept asking everyone, "When's real life?" And they said, "Yeah, they what? said Tuesday." I said uh, Tuesday. That's it was, like, was like, a Wednesday and a Thursday. You know, initially it was going to be the Tuesday, but um, I was on as late as anything. And I'm going, well, it was good because I had to behave myself. I couldn't go and 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 party on. I was so worried about being able to sing and play. And um, I had a little guitar set up in my room in, uh, uh, and so I could go through things through my guitar pedal and a little, a little amplifier. And I didn't get off the ship. Um, when people got off, I, I was lucky enough to have a stateroom thing and there was a curtain and the balcony. And there was about, it was about that, that far apart, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the walls are fairly thin, and I was so worried about practicing my singing, you know, the people through the walls hearing on either side. So I waited for them all to get off the ship, and I made a little airlock vocal booth myself. I closed the door and drew the curtain, and I stood in between the curtain and the window to do my, my vocal practices. So, yeah, I, and I was on late, and I thought, oh, okay, well, at least I got some things done. And uh, the other thing about performing on the ship that was kind of strange too is I remember seeing Wang Chung and seeing um, – uh, Nick, the bass player, going, whoa, you know, this is, we're on the ship, aren't we, you know? I remember on the stage, too, you can't help but feel it. And I had a panic every time I had to lift my foot and switch a guitar pedal because you're on one leg all of a sudden, you go, whoa. And I really thought I was going to, you know, fall over a couple of times. And I thought, yeah, it's, if it's going to happen to anyone, it'll be me. But, uh, That's yeah, the funny rolling. thing. That's the funny thing about those cruises, the stages are built in the rockiest part of the boat. They're all the way at the front or they're all the way at the back. But yeah. for whatever reason, because <laughs> we were back in the, the Royal Theater and we could hear this loud noise and it was the anchor hitting the side of the boat. And they said, oh, don't worry, that's completely normal. And I said, oh. that's what they said about the Titanic. Uh, oh. Yeah. Know. But yeah, yeah, on the stages, you do 
feel it. And, uh, you know, I was watching uh, before Stephen played, Debbie Gibson played, and she has this whole dance thing. And I can imagine oh, yeah. trying to dance. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. I, well, I didn't think of that. But, yeah, I mean, it's me just trying to change a pedal and go, whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting experience but uh i'm thankful that things like that exist i had no idea what to expect had you been on one of those cruises before uh only one, one here in australia it was only like two nights or something so i had a little bit of experience in what it was going to be like uh but you know I, I spoke to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of people go look you know i've got no idea really what the costs are but there was a whole lot of people who were on their six cruise or something and a lot of people from uh, Florida, who didn't have to go very far, and they said, look, you know, we live here, we can go on this one trip, uh, pay, we pay this amount of money, um, but there's all these artists on stage that we get to see and hang out with. So they think it's the best value for money that they can possibly get with um, the lineup and, um, and you know, they, they, there's a couple of ports of call as well. So I get it now. I really get it. You can see people that just love that, that that's their lifestyle, the ship. I never thought that it would be something that I liked. I've done a few of these, the heavy metal ones, it's called the Monsters of Rock Cruise. I've done a few of those with Steven and I worked with a band called Winger. We did them. Um, this one was longer. The 80s cruise was a longer cruise. But boy, I, I it was the closest to a vacation that I feel like I've taken in quite some time. And once Steven was off the boat, I, I was free. And uh it, it, it was enjoyable, and I can see why people like it. Your meals are paid for, like you said. And yeah, and, and and they're meeting up old friends. They've, they've all been on the, you know, people have been on six or seven cruises, you know, so they're yep. catching up yep. with people that they know. And, uh, yeah, and, and the the acts are great. I mean, the theatres are great too. You know, the, the big theatre I saw, um, uh, I saw Sebastian back, who I thought was fantastic. He you know, was great, he, yeah. He's a great personality, isn't he? Great you know, great storyteller, you know, a lot of fun. He was funny. Yeah, he was funny. Very, very, very funny. And, you know, I love the English beats. So I saw them as well. They were just fantastic. And I saw no, them. I, I saw I, Soft Cell. Did you see that? Uh, no, I missed Soft Cell, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say. But I did catch up with a couple of my English mates, um, um, Escape Club and, and Wang Chung, of course, you know. So I, they're, they're sort of people I've worked with before. So, you know, the, the the English and the Australians tend to stick together a little bit. I've noticed, yeah. I, and the people on these boats, the fans are very nice. Uh, I, I really felt like it was a very positive, nice vibe. They don't hassle you. Did you were you in the meeting before we sailed? In that meeting, we all had to go to. And, and yeah, guy, Stephen refused. Stephen refused to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the guy, the guy who was sort of the production manager guy, he said. We have very nice people on this boat and they won't hassle you. If you just walk about, you know, if you hide, then they're more likely to sort of pounce on you. But if you're just wandering about, you'll be fine. And they were. They were lovely. You know, they kept buying me drinks and more drinks and more drinks. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice thing. I mean, I've worked with bands where some members decide to hide. But yeah. I think it's a nice thing for the fans to get to say hello. And it's yeah. a nice thing for people to tell you how much – uh, your music affected them. You know, I was so happy to meet you uh, in one of those lounges and take a picture and things like that. I'm a fan myself. And so it's a nice experience to meet people that you wouldn't meet in your everyday life. You're you're far away right now. You're as far as I'm concerned, you're in the future. Uh, it's I am. We live it's it's um it's uh the day after you over here and we Australians we live in the future and you Americans live in the past and uh it's yeah, no, it's it's Wednesday here, it's Thursday there. Before you go, I want to talk about uh, um, Sirens because yep. uh, that's new music. Now, it, it yep. came out in 2020, but these are pandemic years, and a lot of people's yep. music was hard to promote, was hard yep. to get. And so yep. I, tell me a little bit about that record. Okay, so um, Sirens is a, is a record that I'm most proud of. I guess it's because for the first time I really had to do everything myself including like uh, uh, all the recordings done on this computer in front of me, my Macintosh is in my studio here. I've got some synths here, guitars there, amps there. Uh, and I really had to do the, put the whole thing together myself. And um, I wanted to do – I grew up on sort of bands like Yes and, and things like that. I love the old concept album. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought, here's me thinking, okay, if I – and I love the thought of the, the sirens legend. You know, if you hear the sirens, you're going to crash into the rocks and they're going to sing you, sing to you. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'd like to write this piece called Sirens and I'll have it like as one side of the album and then I'll have, you know, five songs on the other side of the album, like um, – like David Bowie's Low or something. You know, there's a lot of bands that have done something like that. And I thought, okay, so I had to kind of – and I was also a bit lazy. I thought, I think, okay, okay, one song on one side, then, I mean, I don't have to write five intros and middle eights and, and that. I was I was being lazy. Of course, I, I had to write five separate pieces sort of thing that segued into each other. And um, I got really involved in it. I loved it. I had to make – I also had to make the siren sing and tell a story all the way through it as well. And then on the other side, I wanted to have you know, five things that were obviously made for playing live. And uh, I did. I'm very happy with the way it turned out. I love it. So it's, yeah, yeah. We, we enjoyed uh, hearing those songs live. Uh, tell me where we can get it. Where can people get uh, a copy of Siren? Physical copies, not at the moment. Uh, it re- you really, you can only hear it on, uh, get it on Spotify or, or uh, Apple Music, all the, all the digital platforms. You can get it. You can't. Uh, I did make CDs and I did make vinyl. I had a, a, a cover that you could open and um, read all the notes, and it was all very gateful. Funny story about it. You know, it was like I, I used to love sitting down with an album, you know, when you, you got it like sitting down and reading the notes from Abbey Road or Dark Side of the Moon and, and, and reading things into them who played it, who engineered it, who wrote the lyrics, who wrote this. Was there any mention of equipment? Were there any cryptic messages? Um, it's a lost experience, yeah. It is, yeah. I, I tell you, I just remembered one thing I forgot to do. I wanted to put a backwards message. I went, God, ah. <laughs> <See>? <laughs> mm-hmm. was, well, was, you'll have made, to make another record after that. Yeah. yeah. It was made yeah. for people who used to love doing that, too, that old ex- experience of sitting down, putting the record on, getting a cup of tea or a glass of wine and just listening from beginning to end. And people don't really do that anymore, you know. Albums are... You keep reading that people just, it's too hard to make an album. It still costs a lot of money. There's still that same amount of work involved in it. And people have shorter attention spans. You know, pop songs are uh, not three and a half minutes long now. They can be two minutes and people have had enough of them. You know, so well, uh, business uh, uh, is uh, One of your fellow countrymen, Rick Springfield, once said, uh, he's Australian, people forget, but uh, if you can't tell the story in three and a half minutes, maybe you don't have to tell it. And so uh, pop song, uh, and he wrote a few of those, pop song 101, but sh- attention spans are definitely shorter than ever. Vinyl is back. People mm-hmm. love it. But I don't think they're doing what, what, what you were talking about when I did, is to sit with it. I think they pop it on and that's that. Do you want to hear a really good uh, uh, Rick Springfield story? Absolutely. Well, he was in an Australian band called Zoot, Z-double-O-T, and there's some great video clips. He was a guitar, the guitar player in Zoot. Uh, great video clips of them way back in the, I guess, late 60s, early 70s. And my first ever band uh, was formed in high school. We were called Badge after the Cream song. And uh, it was uh, Christmas Eve, I believe, uh, a few suburbs away from where I lived, Zoot were playing, and my band Badge was the opening band. You know, I thought, wow, you know, I mean, you know, Rick Springfield, I love Rick Springfield. And, uh, and so we were down this big, the, the village hall opening for Zoot, and um, it was time to go home. And I thought, wow, I'm really cool, you know, this is really, you know, I'm a bit of a rock star. You know, I think I was about 16 at the time, and uh, walked out with my guitar. My dad was going to come and pick me up, and there's all these, you know, Girls and people hanging out, cool people hanging out. And my dad gets out of the car in his pajamas. Oh, it's like, Dad, Dad, you've just blown my whole career by turning up in your pajamas. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. How funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a zoo. There's great music. I've listened to that. I think a lot of people. Uh, in America, you know, they know Rick Springfield's uh, American music, but he had plenty of. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Music as well. yeah. I think uh, one of the uh, Malcolm Young's brother was a George Young. Was, uh, yes, the Easy Beats, yeah. Whoa. Easy Beats, yeah. That was yeah. a huge inspiration to him. I know. Oh, the Easy Beats were, were sort of like the Australian Beatles. If ever you see some early footage of the Easy Beats, they were fantastic. They were just brilliant. You know, they, they we had a lot of um, post-war immigrants from 
all of the world, but a lot from Scotland, from Glasgow. And uh, that's where the Easy Beats came from. And, um, you know, when the Easy Beats folded, uh, the, the two younger brothers, Malcolm and Angus, picked up with ACDC and uh, George was more or less the producer. And, uh, you know, he sort of guided them through all of that as well. So, yeah, there's only Angus left, sadly, at the moment. Yeah. Yes, that yeah. is right. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> definitely sad. Um, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I love the Australian history. Uh, I was saying, I go, I, I, I got to get out there. And I think one day Stephen will get out there. We've had some offers try to figure out. After the cruise, I go, well, maybe we could take a cruise instead of flying. It, it takes 30, it takes 30 days. Oh, but yeah, Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would be a long, 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 long way. Yeah. I'm going to leave now, uh, get, a, get, a, get a head start. But uh, be a big lineup for 30 days. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there wouldn't be room for passengers. You'd have to have too many bands on there, you know. Or, yeah, oh, for sure. Uh, uh, talk about in, uh, an endurance test. But uh, uh, thank you so much, David, for coming on and uh, and chatting. And I'm so happy to spread the word uh, about your music. There's no website or anything right now, is there? Uh, I'm kind of sort of gently withdrawing from a lot of that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And and the thing that I dislike the most at the moment is, you know, doing doing these things are great. I love this and uh, watching other people's you know um, podcasts and things. I guess the whole social media thing is a little bit overwhelming for me. You know, I'm just a little bit too old for it. And um, so there's less and less. So I'm still on Facebook is the best place to find me, um, and I respond to any mail from any people. You know, I, I talk to anybody. Uh, and yeah, that's about where things are at the moment, you know. So, uh, but it's been great. Thank you very much for, for talking to me. You know, it's it's you know, we have this memory of being on the boat. And that's a lovely memory, and to sort of follow it up today, it's been great. Yes, absolutely. I, I I felt that way as soon as I saw you. I said I've got to convince him to do the show. <laughs> and it, as you said, maybe you're a, um, a little different than my target demographic, which is what I strive for. I, I want to talk to different people. I love all kinds of. A, a different music and so i'm so happy that we're able to work it out i yeah. do hope that we'll get to see you in, in the states at some point or on another cruise uh, mm -hmm. uh something like that uh, i've got my fingers crossed and the music as i said is just a click away you can go to spotify right now and you'll 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 make yourself a real life playlist like i have and uh it'll make your flights go faster because it, it has <laughs> for me <laughs> thank Thanks, you so Dave. much david thank you very much buddy Ciao. And thank you, everyone, for watching, and we will see you.